Good afternoon, traders and investors. Will back here with another one coming to you with a Wednesday market recap. Hope everybody had a very good day. And in today's markets, guys, we had a heck of a very nice bounce, mostly due to the Microsoft and AMD earnings that came in yesterday after the close. Most of the rally started, as a matter of fact, in the after hour session yesterday, responding to those Microsoft and AMD earnings, which really cascaded into today, guys. The names that have been down the most over the past two, three weeks, think big tech and semiconductors, had one of their best bounce day recoveries in recent memory today. And to top it all off, we got Jerome Powell coming in in the end of the afternoon, which added to the bullishness as he hinted at a rate cut in September. Very good day to say the least, guys. So in today's video, I have a few things prepared for you guys, of course. Number one, we're going to be going over those comments from Jerome Powell and what exactly happened during that interest rate decision meeting today. Number two, we're going to be going through a few earnings that I have prepared for you. We are obviously going to cover Meta. Then we're going to dive into Arm. And we also have MasterCard on deck for you too. Those are just going to be a few of the earnings. And obviously tomorrow, guys, very big day as well. Amazon, Apple, Intel, and Coinbase, just to name a few. But for today, we're just going to go through those three, of course. And thereafter, guys, we're going to get through our major technical analysis rundown of our major technical uh, our major stock market indexes rather and lastly take a look at our big tech names so a lot to cover today guys let's jump right into the action so spy up a very healthy 1.63 percent the qqq is almost up three percent they couldn't quite get that beautiful three percent number but very close but take a look at the rotation, guys. XLF and XLV were down. They were doing most of the heavy lifting after of the last two weeks, right? While the QQs and technology and semiconductors were down, healthcare and financials were doing a lot of the heavy lifting. So nice to see them be able to take a little bit of a break as QQQ resumes its own rotation to the upside. Take a look at the heat map right here and you will see that rotation even better. So as of last week, guys, it was a case in point where the bottom half of the market, namely financials and healthcare, were really doing a great job in upholding as best as they could, right? The loss is in the spy. Now today, at least we have a beautiful bounce back. Look at some of the semiconductor names, guys. And it's funny because most of these reacted to positive demand and growth outlooks from AMD. And AMD actually rose less than most of them. A, um, Broadcom up about 12%, NVIDIA 13%. AMD only up 4%, right? They were up about 8% in the after hours. So unfortunately, they did give back a lot of their gains, but nice to see the sector as a whole responding to those earnings. Microsoft largely erasing its earnings loss as of yesterday, but still ending down 1%. For the most part though, guys, technology having a beautiful day, the rest of the market just taking a tiny little bit of a breather, but credit cards, Visa and MasterCard did have a very beautiful day off of the back of MasterCard earnings. Now, let's take a look at the one day relative. You can see that for the most part, it was led by technology to the downside, only really real estate and consumer defensives. Those have been having such a good time over the past two, three weeks. So nice to see them generate a little bit of a pullback when you have the rest of the market running. On the one week relative now, guys, we are actually 100% in the positive. Yes, even technology coming back. So looking very good here, guys, right? It definitely was a buy the dip opportunity. And that's what we're kind of hinting at on the channel for the past two weeks. Yes, the drops were substantial, but I was telling you guys every single day that I was ready to nibble on a lot of big tech and semiconductor names. And if they were to drop further, I would just dollar cost average more and more. That's because guys, with so much uncertainty, it's very tough to know exactly where the bottom of the market will be. The best we can do is go off of historical performance. And whenever we see a 10 to 15% drop on our favorite names, that's when we know to go shopping. So hopefully you guys have benefited a little bit from this decline to be able to go shopping. But if not, that's okay. Still a lot of time left to potentially have some deals on the table. Now, let's get into Jerome Powell's statements right away, shall we? So we're gonna cover that first and then dive into our earnings. So what did Jerome Powell have to say for us? Well, he said a September rate cut is possible. He started talking about the possibility of a September rate cut. That has never happened in any of the prior meetings before. So nice to see them finally responding to that data. So here we go. After this, after the decision, so after his prepared statement that he always reads the first five, 10 minutes of his speech, uh, Jerome Powell said, a reduction in our policy rate could be on the table as soon as the next meeting in September. He's been wanting to avoid giving dates and timelines for the past three, four, five, six months at this point. So nice to see him finally come out there and say what's been on the back of everybody's minds about that rate cut in September. Let's continue. What were his thoughts on the economy and everything? Well, let's have a look at what he thinks about the jobs market. So the unemployment rate has, starting has started ticking up and consumer spending, particularly in categories 
category sensitive to interest rates has slowed. So we've noticed that. Obviously, guys, we talk about this a lot on the channel. The economy is slowing down ever so slightly. The jobs market is slowing down ever so slightly, but is not in a position of a problem on either of the two fronts. Let's take a look uh, further. It's a very difficult, challenging judgment, and we don't want to go too soon talking about rate cuts, and we don't want to go in too late either. So he's feeling good about rate where rates are going. Plus, the policy rate at 5.3%, the Fed still has a lot of room to respond to any perceived weakness, talking about in GDP numbers or in potential jobs numbers as well. You don't hear he continues, you don't see any reason to think that this economy is either overheating or sharply weakening. That's just not in the data right now. And he's right, guys. Yes, can we see potential a uh, little bit of weakness on the jobs market and a little bit of weakness in the economy over the last three, four months? Yes, but it is not at an alarming rate. And that is what Jerome Powell is focusing on. Now, let's continue in terms of the discussions on the rate cuts. There was a real discussion back and forth of what the case would be for moving on rate cuts at this meeting, Powell said. The overall sense of the committee, so obviously there's about 16 members in the Fed. It's not just Jerome Powell's decision. So the overall sense of the committee, as I mentioned, is that we're getting closer to the point at which it will, be, it will be appropriate to begin to dial back restriction. We're not at that point yet. We want to see more good data. So once again, guys, reiterating that the Federal Reserve is currently in a very big balancing act. Keep rates too high for too long and you risk crushing the jobs market and the economy. But cut rates too soon and you may start to see a little bit of a resurgence in inflation. So he's really trying to thread that needle. And as of now, guys, they have been doing a fairly good job at that as a whole. And I think that's largely a byproduct of him not saying anything about the timing of rate cuts this entire time. People have been asking about it since last October. And until today's meeting, he has not moved. So he's been playing his cards very, very well, in my humble opinion. Now, let's continue in terms of the jobs market. U.S. jobs market has softened enough, Fed Powell says. I don't think the labor market in its current state is a likely source of significant inflationary pressures. Trying to avoid a wage price spiral, guys, right? If you don't know what a wage, wage price spiral is, it's when inflation really starts going up, prices go up, and then employers are faced to raise um, their wages as well, and then prices continue going up. So the, it just starts a wheel process whereby prices go up, wages go up, then prices go up again, wage has to go higher, and it creates a spiral that can easily get out of control. No signs of that. The unemployment rate has risen from a half century low of 3.4 to 4.1%, which is still near historical lows, guys. In June, monthly hiring has remained strong, but continues to slow from overheated levels in recent years. There was a lot of talk today, guys, about normalization of the job jobs market, right? So obviously post pandemic, there was a lot, a lot, a lot of pent up demand for labor. And those jobs reports were very, very, very hot. Now the normalization process puts us pretty much back to the eve of the pandemic. So the jobs numbers that you're seeing right now and the unemployment rate that you're seeing right now is the same as what it was prior to COVID. So we're still doing very, very good in the grand scheme of things, guys. So that's pretty much a brief summary on what Jerome Powell had to say. Nothing more fancy than that. The key takeaway was that he acknowledged finally that first rate cut in September is a distinct possibility of being on the table. And the markets reacted, guys. Here is your probabilities for a rate cut in September. You can see now they are up 90.5% percent probabilities of a rate cut in September. And they are up from earlier this week when it was only about 86.3. So nice to see that the market is largely now pricing in that first rate cut to September. And so far, the market has been correct on every single one of these predictions for the past two years. So let that sink in, guys. Usually the market is not wrong. And usually Jerome Powell does what the market expects, just not to throw any um, sticks in people's wheels, in other words, right? So that's pretty much everything we had to cover for Jerome Powell. Now, guys, let's dive right into our earnings. And we're going to start it off with a very good company that I've been telling everybody that I've been buying for the last couple of weeks in my long-term portfolio. And for good reason, that was MasterCard. So MasterCard having earnings today before the open pretty much. And they crushed it, guys. Up almost 4% before retracing a little bit today, adding about 3.63% higher. So what exactly did MasterCard do to get themselves out of these lows and up and above? Well, guys, they simply crushed everything as they usually do. It was business as usual for MasterCard. EPS beat by 2.29% and a revenue beat of 1.59%. Very good quarter for MasterCard to say the least. Let's take a look at some of the data. So MasterCard allays spending concerns with profit beat. So we're going to get into those spending concerns and what MasterCard had to say about them. Now, 
Let's move on. Uh, MasterCard beat second quarter profit expectations on Wednesday and said spending was holding up, reassuring investors worried about customers' financial health after a swath of companies warned of pressure on low-income households. We've talked about consumer discretionary spending, guys, and the moral of the story is that consumer spending has not stopped. It is still at relatively healthy levels. The only thing is that people are not splurging anymore as they were in the past two years. That was a bit excessive and that's what led to the inflation we have today. Consumers are now being more picky on their purchases. MasterCard agrees with this, but says that overall, in terms of historical averages, consumer spending is still relatively healthy. The strong performance was helped by robust growth in key international markets like Europe and Latin America, coupled with a healthy US consumer, the company said. Now, MasterCard's results, while not perfect, should give reassurance that the spending environment remains solid. A tight labor market has ensured job security for customers, allowing them to make purchases without restraint, even as the US Federal Reserve keeps monetary policy tight. And this is true, guys, the, mon the, the jobs market has been very solid, right? Yes, prices everywhere are a lot higher than they were two years ago, but at least we cannot say that there is a lack of jobs in the economy. The unemployment rate is only about 4%, guys. 96% of everybody is employed and wages right now are outpacing inflation. So we will get that purchasing power back. It just takes a little bit more time. Now, trends in July for MasterCard were also strong. Cross-border volume, a gauge of travel demand that tracks spending cards outside the country of their issue, climbed 17% over the last year in July, similar to the second quarter. This is what I've been saying, guys. Travel demand remains extremely strong, which is why I'm still bullish on a lot of travel stocks. Now, MasterCard switched volume growth slows. So it has slowed on a year over year comparison, guys, but we're coming off very difficult comparable numbers. 2023 was a blowout year for uh, MasterCard, right? The beginning of 2023 still plagued a little bit by high inflation and consumers splurging, splurging, splurging on, uh, on non-essential goods, essentially. But MasterCard, in terms of uh, year over year growth, if they can stay close to this 10% mark, which they are, that is the company's historical average, guys. Usually they grow about 9, 10% 9, year over year. So even though you see a decline, it's just because the prior year's numbers are going to be especially hard to beat. No red flags at all. Slight deceleration. So switched volume, which measures the volume of transactions processed on MasterCard's network, were 10% higher than last year in the second quarter, compared with 12% in the year's first three months talking about this graph that I just explained. This supports the overall view that the consumer spending remains on solid ground, albeit slowing slightly. And that's what we were trying to say, right? Several, several firms have flagged pressure on low-income customers as wage inflation moderates and elevated interest rates weigh on sentiment that we know. So let's continue more into some of the MasterCard details, guys. And the thing that I like the most about MasterCard, guys, it's it's such a boring investment. You really don't need to worry about anything, right? Don't need to worry about what happens on their earnings. You really don't need to worry. It's one of those stocks you can just buy in your long-term portfolio and never really think whether or not anything's gonna go wrong with the company. They have such a solid moat, such, si such high profit margins, guys. And it's just one of the best companies in the entire stock market, in my humble opinion. So let's take a look at some of their numbers, guys. Here you go, adjusted revenue, guys. That was up a very healthy 11%. Adjusted net income up 22% as well. Very, very healthy. Net profit margins, 48%, right in line with historical averages. Very boring, guys. Nothing fancy here. They just keep doing their business as usual, and the company just keeps growing. So worldwide, 9% growth. United States, 6% growth. Rest of the world, 11% growth. All markets performing well for them. Now, in terms of transactions and new cards. So transaction growth, you can see that right here, 11%. Very good. And number of new cards growth right here, 7%. That is very healthy for MasterCard. That's usually about the expectation, anywhere between 5 to 8% in net new card growth every single year. So nice to see that they are respecting their minimums right there, right? Now, in terms of uh, further, right, uh, let's go through a little bit more. If there is a little bit more, oh, I wanted to take, I wanted to take you guys through this one. Looking ahead, further thoughts for 2024. They left it blank. I don't know what they're doing over there at the PowerPoint department in MasterCard, but still, uh, that's pretty much everything I wanted to show you guys. Unfortunately, unlike Visa, they don't show the amount of 
capital that they allocate for, uh, let's say, um, accounts that are non-paying, so any credit loss capacity that they have built up. Unfortunately, we don't get any metrics of that. That's what I was looking for in this report, but we didn't get it. Suffice to say that they're probably safe if we have Visa's earnings to go off of. Now, continuing on to MasterCard, guys, I just want to bring you into their free cash flow real quick so you can see uh, net cash providing by operating activities minus the um, uh, pro purchases of um, properties and or property and equipment right here. You can see very healthy number. I wrote it down here, 4.32 billion dollars in free cash flow which is really standard with what the company averages in the past take a look at their free cash flow here on a quarterly basis and you can see last quarter was a little bit of anom anomaly but over the past five quarters you can see four billion right there 3.04 2.5 1.77 so this is actually one of their stronger quarters in terms of free cash flow so nice to see that that is really still not a problem for them at all guys obviously mastercard's balance sheet is extremely strong and their growth is extremely streamlined when i look at eps growth and uh revenue growth this is exactly the chart that i want to see extremely consistent and that should be the case over the last 10 year time frame when we measure revenue as well is very decent guys so very decent report by mastercard business as usual and no consumer worries to really speak of right now right now in terms of moving forward guys in terms of the valuation right because obviously no mastercard was down here a decent little buy well now that they're up only three and a half percent is it still a buy in my humble opinion, guys, I truly do think so. Take a look at this double-digit growth on revenue and EPS for the next foreseeable future. That gives them a 2024 forward PE ratio at $463 of about a 32.4. You might think that that's slightly elevated, but it's really in line with MasterCard's historical averages. Take a look at your PE uh, historical averages right here, and you can see that right now on a forward basis, we should be about a 32.4. So as a matter of fact, that's actually relatively low in terms of where MasterCard has been. If you want them to get under a 30, guys, you really need to see a big market drawdown, right? This is the end of 2022 at the end of pretty much the asset bear market. Take a look. This is COVID right here, right? Uh, during 2020 and 2018 is the um, interest rate hiking cycle that uh, President Donald, former President Donald Trump had to put an end to because the markets were getting a little bit nervous, right? You can see these three big negative events for the overall market are the only times that you will find MasterCard at the lower end of their historical PE averages. As of now, they are within the norm and they are on a little bit of a dip right now, which is why I still do believe it's a very good dip buying opportunity. Now, in terms of the forward peg ratio, it's at about a 2.31, but as I've explained for other companies, guys, because that because of the fact that MasterCard is so consistent and so predictable, it does get a higher valuation from Wall Street just because of those predictable characteristics. So, and, you know, it's very rare to find MasterCard anything below a two peg. So this is okay for MasterCard. Free cash flow yield about a 2.55, which I've also labeled as okay for MasterCard in a bull market. Usually you want to look for a free cash flow yield on companies between three and a half to 5%. But a lot of other companies, guys, especially the more established ones, such as Microsoft, uh, such as MasterCard, companies like Costco as well, it's very rare to find them at an over 3% free cash flow yield. You would really need to see an overall broader market correction uh, for that to happen, right? So as of now, guys, I still do like this one a lot. And now we have a potential trend shift opportunity. So if ever we are going to get maybe a potential retest, right? Where could we maybe be retesting? Well, look at this level right here, right? This is the channel that we may want to add a little bit more MasterCard. We've just broken out of this previous resistance zone and we may be looking to just retest this area and then run also we are looking for weekly trend expansion after being trapped in this weekly downtrend we have a weekly engulfing move same logic applies looking for the retest and maybe run on the weekly time frame the monthly time frame is the reason that i kept telling everybody to buy guys the monthly bulls were in full control and after three months of consolidation into a big support zone we had to be buying and it's nice to see that that buying is finally starting to pay off so MasterCard, short-term swing trade in this level here, absolutely. Long-term investment, no brainer, guys. Absolute yes from me. Now let's move on to our second earnings, guys, and that is going to be covering Meta. So Meta coming in with earnings after the close and what happened with them, guys? A lot of nervousness coming into these big tech earnings. And what happened to Meta? A lot of people were worried about Meta, guys. Meta absolutely crushed it. And I've been saying this for the past month. I was pretty sure that they were going to crush their earnings. And that's exactly what happened. Why? Because of their margin expansion. Margin and free cash flow are absolutely crazy for this company right now, which gives it even near the all-time highs, gives it a very cheap valuation. And we're going to get into that later. So why are they up about 7% in the after hours, guys? 
Well, they absolutely crushed it, as I just said, right? EPS beat by about 9.39% and a revenue beat of about 2% as well. And their guidance for the rest of the year was fairly good. Now, let's take a look into their earnings directly, shall we? So, MetaShares pop on revenue and earnings beat and better than expected forecast. So, triple beat, guys. Revenue, EPS, and guidance beat. Now, let's move on. So, Meta provided revenue guidance for the third quarter of 38.5 to 41 billion or 39.75 at the middle of the range. The middle of the range prior was estimate of 39.1. So there is your beat on revenue guidance. Now, the company reported second quarter revenue growth of 22% from a year earlier, marking the fourth straight quarter of growth in excess of 20%. That is absolutely fantastic, guys. For, for Meta being the size of company that it is, for it to be growing revenue at 20% for the last four quarters, that is really crazy, right? Well, it's not 20% quarter on quarter, like successively, it's measuring year over year, of course, right? Net income jumped 73%. That is the year of efficiency that Mark Zuckerberg started last year, really started cutting costs, right? Uh, unfortunately, laying off employees, but cutting costs across the whole business. And now as you can see the fruits of that labor, guys, 73% in net income. Fantastic. Advertising revenue, which was the crux of the uh, earnings report right here, which largely comes from the Facebook and Instagram apps, rose 22% from a year earlier. Last week, top rival Alphabet reported an 11% increase in Google Ads sales. So Facebook literally doubling Google's performance in advertising growth just goes to show you why they are the leader in the game, guys. Nobody does it better than Meta. So Meta's financials continue to benefit from cost-cutting initiatives that started in late 2022. The company eliminated a total of 21,000 jobs over multiple rounds of layoffs. While it's been downsized broadly, uh, while it's been downsizing broadly, Meta has been spending heavily on cutting edge technologies like AI and the virtual reality and augmented reality tech needed to underpin the metaverse. Similar to other tech giants, Meta has been pouring money into data center infrastructure and computing resources that, the, uh, that Mark Zuckerberg says is necessary to stay ahead of the competition. So here we're gonna get into some data center numbers, guys, and this was one of the biggest arguments is big tech spending too much money on AI, right? Are they spending too much money? We saw it from Google. We saw it from, uh, from Microsoft as well, those criticisms. And what I was saying after Microsoft's earnings yesterday, guys, is that they have money to blow. Once we get into these margins, same as Microsoft, I will show you, they have money to spend on CapEx and it will not affect their bottom lines, not very much at all. So, Continuing, we had a strong quarter. Here's what Mark Zuckerberg had to say. We had a strong quarter and Meta AI is on track to be the most used AI assistant in the world by the end of the year, surpassing ChatGPT. We have, we've released a fir the first frontier level open source AI model, which is pretty much uh, their Llama 3 project, which is a very good project. We continue to see good traction with our Ray-Ban Meta AI glasses. I'm not sure if you guys knew this one. Did you guys know that Meta had a pair of AI Ray-Ban glasses? It's the official Ray-Ban website right here. They're priced anywhere between, let's call it about $350 to about $450, right? Pretty cool. You can pretty much ask an assistant, ask Meta AI through the microphone and the glasses, you can capture because it has cameras. You can take uh, pictures and videos and you can even listen. You can even listen to uh, phone calls or music as well because it has built in speakers. Pretty cool product from Meta, if I'm going to be honest. I kind of like them more than the headset, right? They've been out for about a year now, but I just figured I should point it out to you guys if ever you didn't know they had it, right? So, uh, and we're driving good growth across our apps. Meta said Wednesday that while the company is continuing continuing to refine our plans for the next year, we currently expect significant capital expenditures growth in 2025. There it is. They're going to spend more money on AI as we invest to support our AI research and product development efforts. So let's take a look at that capital spending and see whether or not it is a problem. So here's your segment results from Meta. And what I wanted to bring your attention to guys right here is the Reality Labs. Obviously Meta renamed their entire company to Meta because of their efforts into the metaverse but they're still not making any money from it, guys. And it's not, it is eating to, into their profits. And I'll show you that right there. Not too bad, but still, it's a lot of money that these guys have been burning, right? Here is your operating losses of Reality Labs. I haven't totaled these, right? This is the last two years. If I were to just do some mental math right here, I would say that they've literally dumped close to $35, $40 billion into the metaverse and they barely have any revenues here to show for it. So take a look at this, right? <laughs> Advertising revenues, $38 billion, and the Reality Labs revenues, $353 million. But how much does it lose on a quarterly basis, guys? $4.5 billion. They only bring in 1% 
of all Meta's revenue, right? But they spend 25% of their operating revenue on this endeavor. So you can imagine how profitable Meta would be as it was prior about three years ago. You can imagine how profitable they would be if they didn't spend this. You know what's the crazy part about Meta, guys? Is prior to 2020, Meta had 34% net profit margins and they did not have this segment right here. What's crazy now is in the past year with all the cost cutting savings and revenue distinct expansion in their advertising business, what's crazy is their net margins have now caught back up to 34% net margins, and that is with this, right? So without this, they would probably be closer sitting to about 40, 42% net margins, which is absolutely crazy, guys. Such a glorious company, if I have to say so myself. Here is your expenses as a percentage of revenue to show you guys that Mark Zuckerberg's cost-cutting savings endeavors have really come into fruition. This is when he started them, 2022, where my mouse is. And you can see a net decrease in the last seven quarters in terms of everything, right? The light gray is general and administrative expenses. Those have been slashed, you know, pretty much by uh, about 50%, right? In terms of, or sorry, about 25%. In terms of marketing and sales, marketing and sales as well has been coming steadily down from about 14% in 2022 to about seven. Those have been cut in half. R&D, and Meta needs a little bit of R&D, especially for Metaverse, right? They were at 30%, now down to 27, so nice to see a little bit of cut there, 10%. And cost of revenue, they've done a great job of dis decreasing their cost of goods sold, which is pretty much what they had prior to this cost expansion, right? So very, very good job by Mark Zuckerberg and the management team of controlling costs and really doing a good job of putting the shareholders first, right? That is what they need. Net income, you can see this crazy number right there. EPS expansion, right? Capital expenditures, here you go, right? So year to date CapEx, you can see it is at a net increase. But when I show you guys the free cash flow numbers, you'll see that it doesn't really matter. Even if they are spending 15 billion, guys, they have tons of cash to spend. So family daily active people, the amount of users, right? Now up to 3.27 billion. You can see it's been growing very nicely over the last uh, eight quarters, uh, roughly. Family average revenue per person as well. So the amount of spent on ads, or generated through ads rather, that is also very good at about $12. Really you can see, although there's some fluctuations, it is on a nice overall uptrend over the last couple of years, right? Now, in terms of ad impressions delivered, year over year percentage change, well, we can see a little bit of a decline here, but just I'll remind you guys, these 2023 numbers, they were measuring against very weak 2022 numbers. So 2023 was their, their year of crazy recovery, right? So now for them to be at only 10% when we measure year over year, it's normal. We're back within the averages of Meta's uh, hist of Meta's history, right? So don't be alarmed when you see a net decrease here. It is fine. It's just because the 2023 numbers uh, are measuring against very poor 2022 numbers. So hopefully that makes sense as well, right? That's pretty much everything that I wanted to show you guys in terms of the Meta earnings right there. What I also wanted to highlight, guys, is this following aspect right here, right? So in terms of free cash flow, do they have enough free cash flow to spend on further capital expenditures? Well, let's have a look. They generated 19.3 billion in operating activities, and then we just reduce the amount that they spend on CapEx. They're left with a total of $11.2 billion in free cash flow in a single quarter. That is very, very good, guys. Take a look at their free cash flow in the last couple of quarters, and you can see it's always right around there. 12 billion, 12 billion, 13 billion, 11 billion. So some quarters are definitely better than other, better better than others, excuse me. But even you can see with Meta's increase of capex right there, they're still bringing in very very strong free cash flows, guys. So very good job by the company of doing that. And you can see that even though they issue uh, a decent amount of stock based compensation right here, 11.8 percent, they buy back even more. So they issued forty six hundred dollars worth of stock to employees, and they bought back more, right? So. Uh, issued 4.6 billion and they bought back 6.3 billion. So obviously shares outstanding are in a net decline in the market right now. Extremely solid quarter for Meta. Nothing bad to say about them at all. Take a look at your uh, margin recovery. So here's Meta Platform's profit margins. You can see this massive dip in 2022. Gross operating and net really came down hard from the peaks of 2021. And now they've largely recaptured everything. You can see the bottom line right there as of last quarter was 32.06. Uh, this quarter was actually significantly better coming in. I think I still have it up here somewhere. Did I still have it up here. Yes, I do. I still have it at 34.4%. So still getting a little bit better, guys. Meta is really back on track 
business as usual, in my humble opinion. Such a solid company, guys. Nothing bad to say. Now, in terms of the valuation, let's go have a look. Are they still a buy right now in the after hours at $507? Well, let's have a look here, guys, right? EPS growing 20% year over year gives them a forward P ratio at $500, roughly, of about 24.8. That's pretty cheap, guys. Even at a first glance for a big tech name, very cheap. Now, when we divide this PEG, uh, P ratio by their EPS growth rate per year, you can see, guys, only a 1.23 PEG at $500. That is extremely cheap, guys. It is the cheapest big tech name out of all of them by a wide margin. It's also cheaper than most of any other semiconductor name that has run substantially this entire year. Meta is one of the best deals in the market right now, and I will not change my opinion on that. I've been saying that this entire, entire time, guys, while we've been struggling at these all-time highs, and people saying, well, I don't want to buy Meta. It's at the all-time highs. Well, it's cheap as heck, guys, right? So I'd highly consider that you reevaluate what you deem to be uh, cheap or expensive, right? The share price does not tell the full story. Don't get fooled by something at the all-time highs thinking it's expensive. Always look into the price versus the growth at a free cash flow yield of 4.1%. You remember me saying about MasterCard and Visa, uh, MasterCard, Visa, and Microsoft, how they're kind of stuck between a two point at a 2.5 uh, free cash flow yield, right? Well, Meta's free cash flow yield is absolutely amazing. 4.1%. Anything between 3.5 to 5% for a solid company, guys, is very good. The closer you get to 5%, the better deal it is. So at 4.1, it is very, very strong. Meta, tremendous deal right now. Gorgeous daily uptrend recaptured by the bulls. If for whatever reason we choose to revisit these lower levels right here, even here, guys, it's a decent little nibble. But the true trade, if we want to be technically correct, would be a retest of this prior range right here. 481 down to about 457, right? So if we come back, retest the 481, or maybe just a little bit above, retest these short-term moving averages at about 488. Let's call it about, let's call it about 495, 490. If we can see a little bit of a retest down here, might be a nice opportunity for a swing trade. Obviously, the stop loss goes below this low right here, your most recent daily higher low. 457, and we're targeting pretty much of the top end of the resistance range, which is 530. So decent risk to reward trade, in my humble opinion, for Meta stock. So that's pretty much everything we had for those guys. Now let's jump into the third one of the day, and that is going to be Arm. So let's take a look at Arm, guys. And Arm is a case of a great company, but unfortunately, th this stock for me, guys, it is a great company, okay? But the moral of the story, what it comes down to is it's a great, it, I like the company, but I do not like the stock price. That's all it comes down to when they IPO'd, in my humble opinion, guys, fair value at, you know, this was roughly about a year ago at this point. Now with the numbers that they have today, the valuations down here would be good. But all the way up here, guys, it's just a little bit too rich. So let's get into their numbers, guys. They had a somewhat decent quarter, but unfortunately, the stock is down about 13% in the after hours because of roughly poor guidance, right? So the guidance wasn't too bad, but because this one was up 96% year to date and the valuation is very high right now, any weakness whatsoever was going to be punished. And that's exactly what we had a case of here. Let's take a look. But they did have a very good quarter this last one. So EPS beat by about 17% and revenue beat by about 3.7%. Very good numbers for uh, very good numbers for ARM as a whole. Let's dive into it. ARM issues light earnings guidance as the company stops disclosing number of chips reported as shipped. Kind of like Netflix stopping their report subscribers, right? So ARM results exceeded expectations, but earnings guidance did not. Now let's continue. ARM's revenue grew 39% year over year. Very healthy. Net income came to 223 versus 105 from last year. 2x in net income. Also very good. Now, Arm, here is where why, the reason for the stock decline. Look at how tiny the miss in guidance was and Wall Street had a 12% negative reaction. Just goes to show, guys, when valuations are high, the bar is very high. If you miss even slightly, it can be severely punished. So let's move on a little bit further. The full year guidance, EPS, 145 to 165. The midpoint is 155. That is their guidance. Analysts were looking for 158. Literally three cent miss on guidance, but it just was not good enough. Now, in terms of the revenue guidance, 3.8 to 4.1. The midpoint is 3.95. Analysts were looking for 4.02. Barely missing at all on EPS and revenue guidance, but still, as I said, guys, the bar was set very high, and unfortunately, they missed on guidance. 
the middle of the range revenue guidance range factors in a growth rate from royalties in the low 20s. So this is one thing that I missed as well. Royalty growth in the low 20s, right? Down from a forecast in April of the mid 20s. So think 25, 26% down to 21, 22% royalty growth. Still very good. Anything above 20 is fantastic, right? For the fiscal second quarter, so here's Q2 guidance instead of full year. The RMC's adjusted earnings of 23 to 27 cents per share on 780 to 830. That would imply no growth at the middle of the range. Analysts polled had expected the higher end of the range, 27 cents in EPS for next quarter, and 804 million, which is literally pretty much almost the midpoint, right? So a little bit of weak guidance for next quarter and a little bit of weak guidance for the entire year. That is a region for the, the reason for the decline in the stock today. But this quarter that they just had did very, very well. Now, we previously considered the number of chips reported as shipped by our customers as a key performance indicator because it represented the acceptance of our products by companies who use chips in their products. Now, now um, as we shift our focus to higher value, lower volume markets, such as data center servers, AI accelerators, and smartphone application processors, the number of chips reported as shipped is less representative of our performance as the growth in royalty revenue is concentrated in a smaller number of chips. So good business decision for them, guys. They don't want Wall Street to get too attached at the volume of output and chips that they're putting out there. They want Wall Street to be focused on the quality of the partnerships and the quality of the products that they're putting out uh, rather than just going on a volume number alone. So decent business num business decision by them as a whole, right? Now, moving on to their numbers, guys. If you don't know what ARM does, I've explained this many, many times on the channel, but we're gonna recap it if ever you're new or don't know what ARM does. So ARM basically does not manufacture any semiconductor chips at all. They design the chips, right? So 3D design the chips, and then they sell, aka license those designs to the large chip manufacturers, such as Taiwan Semiconductor, Intel, and everybody else, right? Thereafter, once they have licensed those chips, they collect royalties every year that those chips are being used in manufacturing processes, they collect royalties on those chips. So very high profit margin business, but they have a little one issue that I do not like with the company that does bring down their profit margins. And we'll get into that at the end. So they pretty much service the entire industry with designs that go from smartphone applications, cloud compute for data centers, automotive, and internet of things and embedded, right? So moving on in, let's take a look at a few of their numbers. Record quarterly revenue. We can see a nice little uptick here in the last two years of revenue. They are growing quite nicely, guys. And I've never had a problem with ARM's growth. They are growing very, very nice. It's just, in my opinion, the stock growth has outpaced the company's growth, right? So look, EPS growth for the next foreseeable future, very nice. And revenue growth for the foreseeable future, very nice as well. No problems on those fronts, I will have to admit, right? Let's move on. ARMV ado adoption driving royalty growth. This is just their newest version of their newest chip designs, right? And as you can see, so the older chips, the light blue, are declining year over year in terms of royalties because they be they're being phased out and replaced by the darker blue segments that you can see right here. But it just goes to show you, they're still collecting 60% of the royalty revenue is from designs made in 2016. Just goes to show you how sticky the revenue model is. It's very, very, very good business model. Now, zoom in on this one, guys, because this is one of the most important slides in the entire uh, presentation, in my humble opinion. Gaining market share in a massive market for royalties, mobile applications, they almost own the entire market. That is crazy. Other mobile, 67%. Consumer electronics up 24 to 30%, right? Very good. This is from 2022 to 2024 right now. Cloud compute, 9 to 15% market share. Very impressive gains. Network equip, Networking equipment, right? 23 to 28. Other infrastructure, 12 to 16. Automotive, decent gains, 36 to 41. Internet of things, that is roughly the same. The only line of business that they haven't increased, but still commanding 54% market share there. And total their total opportunity, guys, of all of these segments combined with weights obviously applied to them, 43 to 47% of market share. So safe to say, guys, that ARM literally owns half of the entire designs in any given semiconductor market right now. Very impressive business, to say the least, guys. The industry could not operate without them at all, right? Now, moving on a little bit further, here's their annualized contract value. 
going steadily up. That's very nice for the business as well. Remaining performance obligations. How much money do they have in the pipeline for outstanding deals that they have not delivered yet? You can see right here, this green line. It is said they added 472 million. So you can see they add more and more every quarter. Right now, their RPOs are at about 2.1 billion. That's pretty decent. It's about a half year's worth of revenue for the company. Company makes about four. It's going to make about 4 billion uh, in terms of this year, right? So that's pretty much everything I wanted to show you guys in terms of the ARM slide presentations. Now let's get into the valuation because this is my major concern for this company, right? So as we said, right, net margins are now back to normal above 20%. Oh, actually, I didn't show you guys that yet. So let's go into the net margins, right? So net margins, guys, are fairly good. You can see the net margins right here are just down below 223. I didn't write it on the screen, but if you want to do the quick math, right, just so you guys believe me, 223 in net income divided by total revenue, 939 back at 23.7% net margins. And that was a little bit of a problem for the company. If I move myself over right here, you can see down in, uh, in the right-hand side, last four quarters, been uh, five quarters, been very mixed for them, ranging between 15, 10, 24. Now it's been two quarters in a row that they're putting in 24% net margins. So very decent showing from them. However, right, too much stock-based compensation. It is way too much, guys. 18.7% of the revenue. You remember what I told you guys with um, with Meta, right? How Meta was uh, buying back more shares than they are issuing to employees, right? They're issuing 4.6 billion and buying back 6.3. So we have a net share burn. Well, Arm is the uh, complete opposite, guys, and this is way too much. I understand tech companies are tech companies, and sometimes they issue anywhere up to 10% in stock-based compensation as a percentage of revenue, right? So if you make $10 billion, usually you see a lot of tech companies issue a billion dollars in uh, stock-based compensation. That is normal. What is not normal is Arm and how they are eroding their profit margins. As you remember, I told you it's a very solid business model, right? royalties and designs. There's no product involvement right here. Look at their gross margins, right? Total revenue, 939. Look at the cost of goods sold, $33 million. That's it. Their gross margins are some of the best in the entire market, not only in semiconductors, in the entire market, guys. It's crazy how much money they make off these designs and royalties. Gross margins, 96.5%. So how do you go from 96.5% to only 24% net? Well, R&D, I'll give that to them. You have to do research and development, especially when you're a design company, right? It's necessary. So I'll give them a lot of the R&D expense, fine. Selling general administrative, obviously they have to do marketing, they have to do follow-ups with clients as well. I understand that as well. However, what I do not understand, guys, is the sheer amount of stock-based compensation that is included in both of these numbers. The total stock-based compensation right now is about $176 million. That is way too much, guys. I wrote it right here. It's 18.7% of total revenue. That is twice as high as it should be, in my humble opinion, guys. It makes no sense at all, right? And take a look here. It's very, very easy to see, right? If you were to reduce this by half and get back $88 billion or $88 million on your bottom line, plus 223, and divide that by your total revenues, right? They'd be sitting above 30% net margins, but they're not because they pay too much in stock-based compensation unacceptable for the company. It's not as if it's a new company, guys. This company is like 25 years old, right? So we can't blame it on that fact. So that is just the fact of the matter. Too much stock-based comp, but they do have nice positives as well. We saw EPS and revenue expansion is good and they have no debt to speak of. Their balance sheet is very, very solid. Nothing bad to say there. Loads of cash, loads of decent free cash flow in relation to their revenue, of course. But the valuation, guys, it's just, it's just way too high in my opinion. Revenue and EPS growing healthily. Forward PE at $125 is about an 80, but that's not the problem, guys. When we divide 80 by a very high EPS growth rate, the peg is at a 2.5. Anything under one is good. Between one and two is okay. You obviously want to be closer to one. Above two, you start to really have to ask yourself whether or not it deserves it. Legacy companies that are consistent and predictable, like Visa and Microsoft and MasterCard, like we just saw, they can afford to have high pegs because they're consistent and they're not cyclical, right? They're in any environment business. This one is a cyclical business, as we see with some of their downturns, right? So moving on further, what we have to say about this company, right? Their price to sales ratio, guys, 31. 31. They bring in about $4 billion in revenue on, an, on a yearly basis. And their market cap right now is sitting at $140 billion, giving them a price to sales of 31. It's the highest in the entire semiconductor industry, guys. If you thought NVIDIA was crazy, NVIDIA is sitting at about 24 price to sales, and they're expanding revenue a lot faster than uh, ARM is in relation to their market cap. 
Now, at 31, guys, it's it's just way too much for me, which is why I was saying I like this area on arm a lot more, right? 125 down to 110 could have been a good area, but if you want, truly, this company only really starts to get into fair, fair value when we're in the 90s or the 80s. Now, obviously, it's going to run rich because the sector is running rich and the AI narrative is very hot right now, but that is the fact of the matter. Fair value is indeed down here about 80, 90 bucks. I'm willing to buy this one a little bit more aggressively down here in the 125, 110, but we just didn't get there yet, right? So arm right now down about 12% in the after hours. That's exactly where we are, 125. So how I'm going to play this, guys, probably over the next couple of weeks, I'm probably going to be writing short puts. Short puts anywhere between 115 to 105. I would not mind owning arm there. Nice support area from the past, right? We can possibly see that play out in the future as well. And the company is down significantly from their all-time highs and benefits from a rising tide lifts all ships uh, landscape as well, right? Being that if the rest of the semiconductor market keeps going up over 20 through 2025, I don't really think ARM is going to left behind, get left behind. Probably they continue to rise as well. So currently in a daily downtrend, could be looking for a bottoming out process right here. And then maybe a de decent little swing trade. Just watch for the daily uptrend reversal because then we actually have a place to go on. If you take a trade up here, you can set your trade below the higher low and then ride it to the upside, right? But as of now, I'll be playing fairly defensively on it. Short puts in this area right there. Long-term investment, guys, because of the valuation, I can't say yes. There is far better valued companies even in semiconductors right now, you need to look no further as ASML or TSM to find valuations that are much better, even if those companies are closer to the all-time highs. That's pretty much everything that I had for you guys in terms of today's earnings reports. Hopefully you guys enjoyed those. Now let's dive into some technical analysis with all of these juicy bounces, shall we? So moving into SPY, give me a very quick second. So SPY up 1.63% today, and we were on the watch for this, guys. Daily higher low. Daily higher high, you guys know what that means, right? Daily uptrend back to the bulls, which means that your weekly higher low is set. And we're going to be looking for the continuation of this weekly uptrend. Yes, as I've been saying in every single video, right? Weekly uptrend was never lost by the bulls. We reacted very nicely from the 12 EMA on the weekly right there. Yes, we came a little bit below our recent support zone, but... As of now, the bulls have been able to recapture this. So remains to be seen if we get continuation into tomorrow, probably with the way futures are right now and the way meta earnings are being received, we probably will get some continuation into tomorrow. So daily uptrend is healthily underway. I'll remind you guys, right? Weekly bounce is underway and we never lost the weekly uptrend. So we're really not going to do the fibs on these because we're not in a weekly downtrend just yet. So moving on. Just keep an eye, guys, on the hourly trend. Now that the daily uptrend is set, just keep an eye on your hourly trend. As soon as we lose this hourly trend, you will know that the daily move higher is pretty much stopped out. Then we're just going to be looking for a daily higher low. Anything above 539 at this point, looking for a daily higher low for a continuation of the trend. Now we are back above our most recent area of uh, current support. So we're going to be able to use that area as support as well in the hopes of continuing this daily uptrend. Very nice guys. And as I said, SPY benefiting from a lot of rotation right now back into QQQ and XLF, XLV taking a breather. But overall throughout this entire sell-off cycle, we have noticed that the rotation broad market speaking is very healthy. And I think that health does continue. So very, very nice recovery by SPY. Now QQQ, where was QQQ standing, right? So QQQ also reversing the daily downtrend right now. And we kind of double bottom right here. I'll give it to them. So daily uptrend has been set by the bulls right now, looking very good for the continuation of a bounce. Keep in mind a couple of overhead resistance levels, right? Moving averages and this location right here, which is 678 down to about 673. This box is going to be acting as resistance for the overhead bulls. So what we will need to see, guys, if ever we get tapped out in this resistance location and we cannot push through it in one clean shot, the bulls will need to reset. And at that point, anything below or sorry, anything above 544.77, looking for a daily higher low and recapture of this daily uptrend momentum a little bit further. In terms of the weekly, guys, we would never lost the weekly uptrend either. The weekly higher lows are right down here, 442. And we got the weekly higher low right now at about 455. So looking good for some trend continuation. As I said, we are still in dip territory, guys. There's still a lot of companies big tech and semiconductors that are significantly off their all-time highs. So I do believe it remains a good opportunity to go shopping for your favorite tech stocks out there. Looking good on the Q's recovery. We will see if we continue into tomorrow, right? Or how high we move and before being able to reset that into a daily uptrend. But looking good, the short-term bulls finally recapturing the daily after three weeks of sell-off. Very nice. 
Moving into XLF financials right now, financials were never in jeopardy of losing anything, right? Gorgeous daily uptrend, a little bit of a daily downtrend consolidation right here, and then boom, engulfing move, looking very good. If ever we continue consolidation, if QQQ takes the lead and financials and healthcare have to cool off, you guys know the drill, just looking for a daily higher low, anything above 42.55, looking for that daily higher low for continuation of the uptrend, looking great. And even on the weekly, guys, never in jeopardy of losing anything on the weekly, just a continuation of a gorgeous weekly uptrend. So in the event financials do start retesting these lower levels, guys, I would continue to continue to go shopping, especially in the names that I've been promoting the most on the channel over the last month. Visa is still at a very attractive price level. If ever Visa sets the daily higher low back here, low uh, low 260s, high 250s, great trade entry opportunity. And MasterCard, we just went over it as well. If ever they consolidate, breakout, retest, great trade opportunity for a little bit of financials consolidation. Well-deserved consolidation, in my opinion. Moving into healthcare right now. Healthcare also consolidating a little bit, but they deserve it, guys. They've been holding up the markets the last couple of weeks while QQQ was dipping, right? So, Daily uptrend, clear as day right now. Potentially looking for a little bit of consolidation, looking for a daily higher low. Anything above 147, looking for that daily higher low, simply for daily uptrend continuation. Weekly uptrend was never in jeopardy of being lost at all. You can see gorgeous weekly uptrend right there. So even if we do get a little bit of daily consolidation back into this big level, which was support and will continue to be support as well, we may just be expecting a beautiful weekly higher low using all of this support as a, a good breakout retest level before running a little bit further into the second half of the year. Healthcare looking very beautiful. Moving into semiconductors right now. Semiconductors, guys, look at the percentage gain on this one. 7.63%, right? So semiconductors have been pretty much setting a lot of records this past week. Some of their worst days in the ETF history and now one of their best days in ETF history. So daily downtrend was underway and we have now engulfed the most recent leg of selling so looking very good bulls putting an end to the daily downtrend just a quick reminder keep an eye on your hourly time frame right as soon as this tops out you will know that your daily move is pretty much finished and then we'll be looking for a daily higher low to reset this into a daily uptrend right so not looking too bad just be mindful guys that we do have a little bit of overhead resistance above us right now keep an eye on this level right here right so it starts all the way up there pull down a little bit right here right and we can see moving averages as well acting as a bit of resistance and we do have our horizontal location right previous support previous support and then blasted through this location could be resistance so if we come into it a little bit too hot and then need to reset that's okay we'll create a lot of space anything above 228 just gonna be looking for a daily higher low to reset this into a daily uptrend looking very good even on the weekly as well guys since now the daily downtrend has stopped we have now set the weekly higher lows and we will be looking for since this one did lose the weekly uptrend we will be watching for the size of the bounce guys and keep in mind i was always saying right i erased this to make a thumbnail but look how perfectly we tagged the previous highs resistance levels came right down into it as support and now looking to march right back higher right so looking very, very, very uh, healthy, if I do say so myself as a whole on uh, semiconductors right now. Just going to be looking how high can we get in a weekly bounce? Can we V-shape this or will we have to maybe take a two-step process? But the same thing happened back here, right? Loss of the weekly uptrend and then we just got it right back. So looking forward to seeing what semiconductors can do. Lower on the weekly RSI, monthly, not too much overbought anymore. So some gorgeous consolidation in the last three, four weeks. Now moving into the Russell. So the Russell had a great afternoon, unfortunately gave most of it back. So the Russell really responded well to Jerome Powell. You can see that for most part of the day, it was muted while the rest of the markets ran. And then when Jerome Powell started speaking about interest rate cuts, this one really went a lot higher and got instantly rejected. Why did it get instantly rejected, guys? I'm telling you, this level right here is going to be quite challenging for the Russell. It can probably get through it, but it's going to be challenging to say the least. 232 to 228, huge area of resistance, guys. That is what keeps rejecting your bulls up here. So in the event that we need to have a little bit more consolidation, right? You guys know the drill. Healthy daily uptrend. If ever we lose that and set up for a daily downtrend, a little bit of consolidation, no problem at all. The Russell has run a ton. Weekly is gorgeous right now. If we get some extended consolidation, right? Just going to be looking for a weekly higher low for continuation of the uptrend. So in other words, if we cannot blast through this area in one clean shot, the bulls may need to gather a bit more strength down here before making a second attempt. And I will be looking to buy that dip in the event that it does manifest, right? 213 down to 208, looking like a very good breakout, retest and run location for the bulls. That is the type of trade I'm looking for myself. 
Now, moving on to the Dow Jones last, the Dow Jones up about 0.24%, decent day for them as well. And as a whole, guys, the Dow Jones really doing a great job of holding up the markets in the respective value-oriented industry as well, right? So the Dow Jones daily downtrend, daily engulfing move right there. So now they have created a ton of space in order to, if ever they retrace, set up for the daily higher low for daily uptrend continuation, right? Looking very good. Anything above 39,800 daily higher low for continuation of the uptrend. Looking very healthy on the Dow Jones. And on the weekly, look at this gorgeous weekly uptrend, guys. So much space. Even if we do have some extended consolidation on the Dow Jones, bringing us down into this location right here. Just understand, guys, we're just looking for a weekly higher low for continuation of the uptrend. I do not think the bears are going to get through 39,800 uh, down to about 39,500. Going to be very tough for them to blast through this area right there, especially with the continued rotation uh, into some more value-oriented names. Now let's take a look, guys, at some of your big tech names, shall we? Give me another quick second. And let's move into it. So moving into Apple right now, Apple, of course, is going to be very tough to derive short term price action just because of the fact that they have earnings tomorrow. So that being said, let's derive some uh, expected move levels on Apple, right? So moving into Apple expected move, you can see that they're going to about move about to move 4%, right? So about 230 to the upside and 213 to the, down, to the downside is the expectation. So if we do break above 230, I'll remind you the context, right? Daily downtrend was underway. We are looking for the bounce right now. If we get a move above 230, above our most recent high of this most recent leg of selling, it will be a daily engulfing move. The bulls will create a lot of space off these lows in order to set up for a daily higher low and get back the daily uptrend that they had lost right here. That is the upside scenario. Now, the downside scenario is just continuation of this daily downtrend and 4% could put us maybe 213, 210, right? Well, at least we do have some decent support down there, 213, 210, and is also coinciding with our 50-day moving average. So if anything, if Apple does choose to consolidate down here, bringing us down into the 213, 210 location, guys, I probably will be interested in writing some short puts, maybe 205 all the way down to 200 as better pricing as I can get. That being said, Apple right now is in weekly consolidation mode, right? And the weekly higher lows are right here at about 206. So this is where I want to be writing my options, guys. 206 down to about 200. This little pocket that we have right here, because if ever we do fall back deeper into that pocket, I think the bulls are going to have a great time defending this one. It is a monthly breakout and maybe retest in the month of August, retest of the all-time highs retest and run. That is in the event that earnings are poorly received and we get some continuation drawdown into here. As a whole though, Apple not looking too bad at all leading into earnings. So we will see what happens and we will position our trades accordingly after the fact. Now, let's move into AMD. So AMD, unfortunately, guys, sacrificing a lot of their earnings move that they had today, right? So take a look at this. They open the morning, uh, you know, they open the morning right here and you could see about an 8% gap up from the lows of yesterday and unfortunately gave it all mostly back leading right into Jerome Powell where they actually had a decent little recovery. What are they trying to do though, guys, right? If we take off the after hours, it'll make a little bit more sense, okay? Take off the after hours, look, right? So hourly has been in a massive hourly downtrend this entire time, right? Massive, massive, massive hourly downtrend. They tried, they tried right here. We touched on it in the video, the bounce was weak and then boom, back to hourly downtrend. Now look, Huge engulfing move after earnings, looking to set the hourly higher low. Where are we reacting from, guys? This location of last support uh, that we had down here, using it as support, looking to set up the hourly higher low and go for the hourly trend change. That is what the bulls are trying to do right now. So consolidation, decent in my humble opinion. And you can even see that in the daily bounce as well. We were talking about this in yesterday's video. Third leg of daily leg down and then big engulfing move. So the bulls do have a lot of space. Anything above 135, going to be looking for the daily higher low and then maybe move up to reset the daily uptrend. Where did we react from? The exact location I said in yesterday's video. 200 day moving average, the green line right here. That was about at 152. And then we have this whole area that is going to be acting as resistance, 154 up to 160. So in my humble opinion, guys, the bulls may have to just do exactly what they're doing now multiple step this into a culmination of breaking this area above. But I still love the company guys right now looking to set the weekly bottoms in motion as well. And as well, guys, just looking looking to eventually reverse this now unfortunate monthly downtrend back into recovery mode. And I do think that AMD, although the recovery might be a little bit slower than people expect, do not forget what we said in their earnings yesterday, guys. Their 2025 year is going to be so explosive in terms of EPS and revenue guys 
it is going to be one of their best years in company history. So for buying stock, we at least have to let them come into that growth, right? If we're buying stock right here, I understand if you're swing trading it, but if you're buying it for a longer term investment, guys, don't be disappointed if AMD is underperforming its competitors. Next year should be their best year. And that is when I really think the stock will be heading higher towards the 200s. This year, can we recapture maybe 170, 180s, 190s? Sure, with some potential to 200s later on in the year, yes. But 2025, that is when most people think that it will really explode past the all-time highs, right? So great, great, great uh, initial point of investment for me. I like the company and the valuation down here is quite decent too. Moving on to uh, Amazon. Give me another quick second, guys. Sorry about that. Amazon today, very healthy, 2.9% to the upside and even more in the after hours, almost at about $190. So Amazon looking very good, although they do have earnings tomorrow, guys. So Amazon with earnings after the bell tomorrow. So price action, even though the bulls have recaptured the daily uptrend, guys, it's going to be really tough to drive uh, just because of the fact that they have earnings. So let's have a look at their earnings, guys. In my humble opinion, guys, Amazon is absolutely going to crush earnings. I'll be for I'll be forth coming with you guys. I am probably going to be writing some short puts aggressively on this company leading in earnings and probably go with a few call strategies as well, just because I think this year should be one of the better years in company history. Now, obviously, we've seen what can happen from Microsoft, Netflix, Google um, and other semiconductor names. They can go down on earnings. But in terms of the numbers they're going to report, guys, I think it's going to be crazy. So take a look at the expected move, guys, about 8% up, 8% down. So that would put us at about 202 or 172 to the downside. So let's go through both of those scenarios, right? So if we do blast off to 202, well, we're going to be all the way up here. Daily uptrend will be clear as day. And then we may just be looking for a blast above the highs, retest of these highs, nice breakout retest, and then run trade. That could be on the table if ever Amazon ends extremely higher after their earnings. Now, in terms of the downside allocation, right? What was the expected move to the downside? It was about 8%, right? So 8% would put us pretty much all the way down to about 172, as we were saying. 172 is exactly in my buy location. If Amazon drops tomorrow in the low 170s, high 160s, I will be going very aggressive on this one, guys. Uh, not only will I be going aggressive before the earnings, but after earnings, we come down here, I will be buying everything. I'll be buying shares for my long-term portfolio. I'll be buying swing trading positions as well. So just keep that in mind. That is what I'm doing gorgeous level of support, which ties into prior monthly support. This was huge monthly resistance, guys. All of 2020 and all of 2021, big monthly resistance. This is two years worth of resistance, which means it'll be extremely solid support for the bulls, which is why if we come down into this area, as we tapped into recently, as I was saying, great buying opportunity for Amazon. So that is the expectation for tomorrow. Hopefully that makes sense. Moving on to uh, Google. So Google also performing decently today, up only 0.75%, but at least it's something, right? Google still in a little bit of a daily downturn right now, looking to set up as high as possible, right? We need this bounce to continue. So far, so good. We have not lost this hourly uptrend just yet. So keep an eye on the continuation of this hourly uptrend. When we lose it, that is when you know your daily bounce is finished. And when we lose it, you need to measure the size of the bounce in relation to the most recent uh, lower high right here. And the size of the bounce right now, I'll zoom in, is decent. It's about a 50% retracement. I would like to see this get up as high as about 61.8 at about $177 for the share price. That would be rejecting from these moving averages and rejecting from the prior support, which is resistance two. So if they can get up into this area in the first motion, that would give them enough space, guys, to eventually be able to set the higher low. Anything above 166, looking for that daily higher low to reset this into a daily uptrend. Looking very solid on Google. I still like the stock down here uh, in the lower 170s at 170 or even below, guys. It is a screaming buy for me. I have put on positions in these lower levels and I will continue to play it, guys. Anything under 175 on Google, I really like for this stock. And the weekly, well, they're just going to be looking to recapture that weekly uptrend eventually, right? So then unfortunately, they lost the weekly uptrend with the cut of the lows right here. Going to be looking to recapture that ever so slowly. Same thing that happened back here. They can recapture it. It's just sometimes it just takes some time, right? Same thing that happened right here as well. Loss of the weekly uptrend. And it took them a two-step process to do it this time. So we'll see if they can V-shape this or if they maybe have to take a slower two-step process, which is um, <clears throat> what they can do sometimes. Moving into Meta, right? So looking at Meta, Meta up obviously very nicely in the after hours, up even more right now, up to about 510. So 510 is right about here. As I was saying, guys, in the analysis for earnings, daily uptrend is confirmed right now, may just be looking to get rejected at the previous all-time high resistance. If we get into this area in one single move, that's going to be a big move, right? So resistance is above us. 
515 up to about 530. So we're almost right there. If ever we cannot get this uh, break done in one clean motion, may just get rejected here. And we're going to be looking to set up for the daily higher low and move into the new daily uptrend continuation, right? So meta, either way, looking extremely good. Even at the current valuation, we literally just did it together, right? Even at the current valuation, 500, 510, it is still a very good bet for any long-term portfolio. And I will continue to play meta right now, guys. I really like playing put credit spreads on meta because short puts, it's a lot of capital, right? $50,000 for one contract is a lot of capital put up there. So usually when I play meta, I like to play it about $30 away from the current price. And I like to play put credit spread. So put credit spreads could be very interesting in the near term future on a weekly or 30 day basis. I like these levels right here, 485 475, that's the location that I'd like to play some put credit spreads because it's in the larger base of support that we have formed all the way down here. So very nice job on Meta today. Moving into Microsoft right now. So Microsoft down only 1.08%, looking to eventually reverse this daily downtrend, right? Nasty daily downtrend. Microsoft is such a nice buying opportunity down here, guys. Can it continue lower? Sure, this would be an even heavier buying opportunity, but right now it is a buying opportunity. We went through the reasons why over the last two weeks, right? Just go back in Microsoft's history and you tell me when Microsoft is down 11% from recent highs, has it been a good buying proposition? I'll just run through them together, guys, right? And you tell me whether or not it's a good endeavor buying this company in the context of an overall bull market when they're down 11 to 13%, right? Not going to go through all of them, but you guys by now get the point, right? Always a good opportunity to be buying this legendary company. One of the most solid companies, uh, one of the most solid financially run companies in the world. Daily downtrend, looking for the bounce eventually. We need to get that hourly trend back. So far, no real dis uh, defined hourly trend change just yet. So we'll look for that to happen. When that does happen, your daily bounce will be underway. And as we've said previously, going to be looking for the size of the bounce in relation to 432.07. If we can get as high as possible in relation to that, we create a lot of space above these lows to be able to set up for the two-step daily uh, uptrend resumption process, right? So Microsoft, not looking too bad. Just keep an eye on the, on the size of the bounce when the bounce starts happening, but it looks like it does want to run. I would not be surprised if this one is green tomorrow with the rest of the overall market performance. Moving into Netflix right now. So Netflix, unfortunately, continues. Uh, uh, it's being, you know, really muted at these lower levels right now, right? They've been obviously dealing with a little bit of boycott issues after their former CEO uh, was, well, not caught, but after he was seen donating $7 million to the Kamala Harris campaign, which apparently offended a lot of, uh, well, you know, a very large demographic of the American population. So you've been having some trending boycott Netflix, which is why you do have as well as the overall tech weakness. You also have some share specific weakness as of recently, but so far it hasn't been uh, too negatively affected by it, right? So moving on in, still a daily downtrend on Netflix. We will be looking for eventually that daily trend recapture. It's all in the size of the bounce, guys. Look at this bounce right here, 647, right? So keep an eye on the size of the bounce. Daily uptrend it seems as though it wants to get underway. And then we'll be measuring if they can really eclipse this 650 level right here. They will be well on their way to recapturing that daily uptrend. If we can continue to the downside, we still have good support levels down here at about 607, 605. So I'll take this one day at a time on Netflix, guys. I still like the valuation of this company as a whole. And even though we did lose the weekly uptrend as a result of the sell-off right here, Netflix can do that and then recapture the weekly uptrend as well. They've done it a few times where they've lost the weekly, uh, you know, in a short amount of time, and then it takes them a while to recover, right? So this can either be a V-shape or two-step process, but I see no issues in the fundamentals of the company. This green box is my first little buy nibble area. I wouldn't mind buying a few shares of Netflix down here, but if for ever which reason, guys, this company gets affected by company specific news or the overall market sell-off, let's say today was just an anomaly bounce and we continue sliding, 575 to 550, very decent buy opportunity in my opinion. Moving on to NVIDIA now. NVIDIA, one of the leaders on the day, of course, they were up a whopping 13%, erasing all of the last three days of negativity. So looking into NVIDIA, size of the bounce, guys, you tell me, right? This is a 100% engulfing move. So the bears have now lost the downtrend. The bulls have now recaptured a little bit. They've now set up themselves beautifully. If we do have a little bit of a decline tomorrow, guys, going to be looking for a daily higher low into daily uptrend continuation, looking very, very healthy for NVIDIA, guys. 
all in the hourly uptrend, right? Recapture the hourly uptrend. We'll see how long it lasts and whether or not they get rejected by this uh, prior support area, which is now going to be resistance and all the moving averages too. So if they do choose to consolidate after such a crazy one day's worth of move, well, we're just going to be looking for a daily higher low. The best case scenario is get me above this area right here. Get me above 120. It already is in the after hours. Get me above 120, then we can use 120 to sit on as support and restart the daily uptrend from there. So now that they've lost the daily downtrend into up into um, uh, upswing rather, the weekly lows are set, and now we're going to be looking for the size of the weekly bounce to be able to reset into a weekly uptrend. Looking very decent on Nvidia, and we came down into my buy area, which is why I put a couple orders down here, guys. Right, I bought a tiny little amount of shares for the portfolio and made a swing trade with some short put options down here at around the 94, 95 level. Still really do deem this to be a great level to be positioning on NVIDIA. Uh, so if ever we have a little bit of a dip down into here, look for some short put options, guys. 105, 100, nice area to be collecting some premium. Moving into Tesla right now, Tesla with a nice recovery after yesterday's downside of about 4.24%. But you know, still in the context of this daily downtrend motion. So what we're going to be looking for here, guys, is a break of this line that I pretty much um, pretty much drew on the chart yesterday, right? Need to break the highs of the last few days. 232. If we can get that done, well then, daily uptrend is back underway. We officially have our weekly higher lows being set. Let me extend this range right here. Our weekly higher lows are set, and we're going to be looking for the resumption of the weekly uptrend with resistance put high at about the 270, 260 level. So good expansion by Tesla. But if we fail and revisit these lows right here, be very careful for the daily downtrend continuation. Further weekly consolidation continuation and may just bring us down into my favorite location for Tesla, which is maybe the 215 down to 200 level, 215 to 190 to be more specific. All of the major moving averages are sitting right there, 12, 26, 50 and the 200. So it should be a very nice area for a potential little bit of a bounce before maybe putting in a little bit of a leg higher. So this is where I really want to be playing Tesla more aggressively, but looking good now, all things considered. Now, lastly, moving into Palantir. So Palantir obviously having a nice day as well, 1.97% uh, to the upside, but Palantir in a little bit of a daily rut right now. So we will see if they break the high of the Monday session, daily uptrend is resumed, and that will be the extent of our weekly consolidation. Just a little bit of a tap, right? Breakout of this range, breakout, retest, and maybe trying to attack this infamous 28 $29 resistance line. That was the case for 2020 and 2021. So looking pretty decent with that momentum. We'll be on the watch for the break of this and attacking the higher level. However, if we continue our slide, continue the daily downtrend slide and continue our weekly consolidation a little bit more, understand the bulls have tons of space. Anything above 20.4, looking for the weekly higher low for the continuation of the trend. I really like Palantir, guys. If I can get some shares 25, 24 or below, I will be willing to play this stock a little bit more aggressively, guys. So they have earnings on the next Monday session. I think they're going to kill it, guys. I really have a good pension. After looking at their earnings and their progression over the last two years, I've seen some net progression, especially in the last three quarters, guys. I think they're really going to have a good one next Monday, right? So that's pretty much everything for our daily market recaps. The highlight of the day, guys, really has to be our semiconductor. So let's run through them very, very, very quickly. SMCI, they have earnings next Tuesday. This is true, but they are in a very nice area of support right now, breaching our lows. So the market maker is clearing out a bunch of people stop losses, but it could be a nice little opportunity for a little bit of a swing trade, guys. If you are bullish on this one, well, you're getting better pricing than anybody since the month of February. You can play this one, but be very, very tight on your stops, guys. 656 is the range for the stop losses. And then TP1 is right here, 810. And take profit to top end of the range, 953. So good risk to reward location, in my humble opinion, reacting nicely from a 200-day moving average. Now, the other ones I may be looking into, Micron as well. Micron has come down a ton. Their growth prospects for the next couple of years are amazing. We covered them a few times in recent history, take a screenshot if you want of this. Uh, this was done pretty much two weeks ago, but I like them, guys. Why? Because it is a monthly looking for the breakout retest of prior monthly all time highs. We pretty much tapped it, tapped it on the bum, right? Looking very nice. 200 moving average right there. Micron, one that I continuously like in these lower levels, right? I was I'm willing to write some short puts, maybe 104 down about the 100 mark valuation down there is quite decent. And the growth is very, very nice as well, right? Those are just a few, but uh, other ones that I'm looking into, guys, obviously ASML. I already bought some shares. You guys know that. But even right now, guys, I started buying my shares 
here and I de started DCing a little bit, right? So still at a very decent level, daily uptrend resumption, looking for the recapture, looking for these to be the weekly lows, reacting gorgeously from our overall support zone, right? Sorry, I'm going through these fast, but I wanna cover them as much as possible. Maybe looking for the resumption of the weekly uptrend monthly, Never lost a monthly uptrend, looking good. Moving on to TSM now, guys. TSM as well. TSM looking amazing as well. Nice little discount right down there. 152 all the way to 148 is an area I love writing short puts in. As a matter of fact, I closed mine today. Very nice profits right there. Daily uptrend resumption, so looking pretty good. That means that the weekly higher lows are set. So trade is as follows. Entry is here because we have a daily uptrend in motion and the breakout is underway. The stop losses go below here, 152, 150, 150. Stops go below there. Where are we targeting, guys? This is a larger form swing trade. We are targeting darn close to the all-time highs, if I do say so myself, right? Targeting pretty much, you know, expansion, high 180s to 190 because we're just looking for the monthly uptrend continuation. And the valuation on this one is very, very good. We did them after their earnings just a few short weeks ago. Their peg ratio at 170, which is literally right now, was a 1.38. Very, very cheap and looking excessively good. Look at this weekly. Look how good this looks on the weekly, right? Nice weekly bottom in this location right here. Looking to recapture that weekly uptrend um, eventually because we lost it, of course. Maybe a two-step process, but probably a guaranteed process in my humble opinion. And I, that's pretty much other than that. AVGO as well, right? So AVGO has to be said about the... Uh, about the uh, technical formation of this chart. No earnings for them for a while, right? But they did have a, a very, very healthy move. So daily uptrend now back in motion. Any move lower, daily looking for the daily higher lows, coming down maybe into 153, 154, if we can get it. 154, swing trade opportunity. The entry goes here, stops below the lows right here, or you can pretty much set them, if you have a wider estimate, right? You can set them obviously below the lows of support and just maybe DCA in if we get there. Um, that could be another consideration because it is a very, very solid company. But my preferred strategy is this. The breakout, retest, and run strategy, right? With stops below the most recent low. And at that point, you would be targeting weekly levels because it's a daily uptrend, right? You'd be targeting pretty much uh, trend expansion 177 and all the way to the all-time highs 187 for take profit number two. Looking very good. Looking like they want to start reversing the weekly. Where did they react from? All-time high resistance. Now support. Looking very good for continuation maybe of this monthly uptrend. That's pretty much a summary of the overall semiconductor guys so hopefully you guys enjoyed that and hopefully you guys enjoyed the rest of the video today so if you did consider dropping a like would appreciate it for the growth of the channel consider subscribing to the channel if you're new as well would love to have you here we do these every monday to friday after the close the videos during earnings season are a little bit longer guys but usually when we're not in earnings season we do them about, you know, anywhere from about 30 to 40 minutes, which includes a portfolio recap pretty much every single day. And lastly, if you have any questions, guys, right, in terms of the bounce, semiconductors, names to play, value rotation and whatnot, I've done a bunch of videos on the value rotation in the past week, so go check them out, definitely. Uh, the top stocks that I'm looking to buy, of course, for that value rotation, which are still good plays in my opinion, right? So if you have any questions at all, leave them down below in the comments, and I'll be happy to answer you. Take care, guys. Have a great day trading tomorrow. Big day tomorrow as well, guys. Apple and Amazon will be reporting after the close. So take care. Have fun. Good luck. I love you guys. Peace.